Hello everybody and welcome to the Fulbright Speaker Series. I am Angeles Paquerizo and I'm going to be your host today. Before we start, let me let you know a few housekeeping issues. The webinar will be recorded and available in a few days. You are muted, but you can use the question and answer feature to ask questions and we will have time for a QA session at the end of the presentation. Since 1946, the Fulbright program has fostered bilateral relationships between the US and over 160 countries worldwide. Today, the fundamental principle of international partnerships remains at the core of the Fulbright mission. We are living in unprecedented times. The COVID pandemic has infected 10 million people and taking over half a million lives, half a million lives, and it's still growing. Obviously, we were unprepared for the extent of this pandemic. The COVID-19 outbreak has had a profound impact of, on our lives, changing the way we interact with friends and family, the way we work, and the way we live our lives. As we navigate these challenging times, we want to take the spirit of the Fulbright and reach out beyond borders, cultures, race, religions. We want to reach out to the human beings and together make a difference. Because we are all in this together as individuals. And only if we work together, we will be able to fight this virus with knowledge, hard work and sacrifice, determination, responsibility, and collaboration. We believe that sharing knowledge is crucial now more than ever. Let's fight this virus together and we will overcome this pandemic. And for that, we are going to initiate our Fulbright virtual speaker series with the topic of high urgency and relevance by an internationally recognized expert in infectious disease and a leading voice during the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Robert Scully, also known as CHIP. Dr. Scully is an infectious disease professor in the School of Medicine and director of the International Affairs at the University of California, San Diego. With more than 40 years of leading research in infectious diseases and more than 30 years as a professor of medicine. I could spend the whole hour presenting his very impressive list of accomplishments, but we can wait to hear from him. During this webinar, Dr. Scully will present current data on COVID-19 and suggestions for moving forward safely. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Scully. Chip, we are delighted to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us. The virtual stage is all yours. Annalise, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. And I, I look very much forward to um, talking with you for the uh, next uh, number of minutes. So tonight I'm going to talk about um, the SARS coronavirus. Um, I'll talk a bit about kind of how we got to where we are, but I want to focus uh, toward the end about uh, looking at what might be some lights at the end of the tunnel, uh, because we need to think uh, about how to get out of this mess we've gotten ourselves into. It really began a relatively short period of time ago. Uh, it was only about six or seven months ago that we began to hear glimmerings about a serious respiratory illness that was circulating in Wuhan, Japan, uh, Wuhan, China, a city that uh, is located midway between Beijing uh, and Hong Kong. This respiratory illness uh, was initially felt to be around a uh, wet market uh, and uh, thought to be uh, being transmitted uh, among people who worked in or shopped in that wet market uh, over 
uh, the uh, last few weeks uh, in November and December. By early January, it was circulating rapidly uh, throughout um, Wuhan. Uh, within about 10 days of the first part of the year, 5 million people left Wuhan and went to other parts of China. And over the course of that month, uh, 80,000 people developed uh, this respiratory disease in China. Since that time, uh, China has gotten, uh, for the most part, control of the virus, but it spread initially regionally to Japan, Korea, Thailand, and then from there to Europe, to the United States, and now is beginning to pick up uh, speed in Latin America and is moving into Africa. In short, in a six-month period of time, uh, as has been said, we've had over two and a half million cases of this uh, virus that we know of, uh, and uh, over 500,000 deaths with 126,000, a quarter of these uh, being in the U.S. Um, of the deaths. And today, uh, at congressional testimony, uh, our um, leader of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases made the comment that uh, we could be seeing U.S. cases rise to 100,000 a day uh, from the current 40,000, which is a substantial increase from the early part of the month. So what I want to do today is, is try to see if there are ways we might be able to get out of this mess uh, that we've gotten into over the last six or seven months. I'll start by talking about the science because it's always important to understand the pathogen you're trying to go after as you plan your way out. I'll say a bit about how the virus is spread around the world and where it is now. And then I'll talk about some of the steps that have been taken elsewhere uh, and can be taken here to blunt the spread of the epidemic and ultimately uh, bring it uh, to a close uh, with some vaccine and drug discussions. So what about the science? We know this disease is caused by a coronavirus. Coronaviruses get their names by uh, the crowns that they have on the surface uh, as noted by electron microscopy. We've known about this class of viruses uh, since the mid-1960s. Uh, and as the uh, knowledge has uh, been um, accumulating about these viruses, uh, we uh, have realized that they circulate in many different animal species that are particularly uh, important uh, in bats. Bats serve really as a, um, both a, a means for these, uh, these viruses to grow and mingle and interact uh, with each other and to be spread to other species, including humans. Uh, as we sit here tonight, uh, coronaviruses around the world are growing in uh, multiple bat species, evolving, recombining, uh, and finding ways to uh, spill over into the human population. Dr. Scully, can I interrupt you for a second? Do you mind to change your screen? We can see now the presenter screen. I will change the screen. Hold on here. Thank you. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So what we've seen over the course of the last um, uh, six months is the spread of this particular uh, coronavirus that I'll talk about in more detail and compare to the ones we've known about for a long time. But it shares features with other coronaviruses that are very important. The most important feature is that it's an RNA virus. And RNA, RNA viruses in general have a relatively high mutation rate uh, that allow these viruses to mutate and to recombine and to continue to uh, evolve into uh, new strains. Uh, creating opportunities for the virus to remain in individual species in which they circulate, including man, and to move into new, uh, into new species as evolution occurs. So this RNA virus uh, has, uh, as one of its key features, uh, spikes on the surface of the, uh, of the virus, uh, the tips of which define uh, the species and the tissues in which the virus grows. The tips of these spikes are the uh, binding um, domains that each viral particle uses to bind to uh, the uh, surface of cells uh, that it can infect. Uh, in the case of humans, uh, this uh, coronavirus binds to the ACE2 receptor, which as I'll discuss in a minute, is present in the lungs and in the GI tract in particular. Now the family of coronaviruses uh, is in a larger family called nidoviruses, and the coronaviruses that uh, uh, we are dealing with now are ones that have only gotten into the human population over the last 20 years. Coronaviruses in general by molecular archaeology have been around in the human population for 800 years or more. The ones that have been around for the longest period of time are the ones that we live with uh, every winter uh, and cause uh, upper respiratory illnesses that last for two or three days, mainly the sniffles, and go away. 
uh, when you go and see your physician and he or she tells you that uh, you have the flu, but it's not really the flu because the test was negative, about a third of the time it turns out to be one of these uh, three coronaviruses uh, that, uh, that have been, uh, that we've accustomed to. About 20 years ago, we began to see new coronaviruses beginning to emerge from, uh, from bats into humans, sometimes through uh, intermediate species like civets, with the, um, with the SARS coronavirus one that circulated in South China, Hong Kong, and got as far as Toronto uh, almost 20 years ago. The MERS coronavirus, which came into people in the, um, in the mid Middle East through camels about 10 years ago. And over the course of the last six months, the SARS coronavirus too, all members of the same family, uh, each of which uh, have been uh, have presented with diseases in humans in which respiratory uh, symptoms are the primary manifestations. They've had differences in severity. The mortality rate with original SARS coronavirus was about 10%. The mortality rate with the MERS coronavirus was up to 40%. And this SARS coronavirus has a mortality rate which is a bit lower than these two, but it's much better at spreading around. Now, why is that? It has several features that really are ingenious uh, in terms of uh, being able to uh, get around the human population. Among the most important is that it turns off the innate immune response. The innate immune response is our first line of defense to any pathogen that comes our way. Innate immune responses uh, are general immune responses that don't need to know what the pathogen is. They just need to know that one is there. And these include molecules like interferons and cytokines. Uh, these are, in general, the things that make you feel bad when you have the flu. And what this particular coronavirus does is it evades this innate immunity by turning off the program uh, that produces uh, interferons and some of the other key innate immune molecules when the coronavirus is, um, is encountered. This is some work by KYUN from uh, Hong Kong University in which you took normal lung tissue from healthy people that had been removed at surgery for other indications and challenged uh, the uh, lung tissues um, cultures with the original coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 1 in blue, the one that was here 20 years ago, and the current SARS coronavirus in red. And you can see that over time in culture, you begin to see interferons being produced in response to the original coronavirus, but not to this new coronavirus. What this means is that there is no uh, innate immunity uh, confronting this virus. It allows the virus to grow extremely rapidly. You can see here that the virus, if you look at the area under the curve, is growing about three and a half times as fast in these lung tissues as the original coronavirus species, and it's doing it with no symptoms. So what this allows the virus to do is to set up rapidly spreading infection in the lung without opposition that spreads up into the uh, nose and the throat at a time when the person is unaware of their infection. And when that happens, uh, you can see this is the, these are, um, CT values, levels of virus uh, in, um, by PCR uh, in the nasopharynx. You can see that at the time people show up, they've already been shedding virus for a couple of days. And over the course of a couple of weeks, the amount of virus in your nose and in your throat gradually declines. This is how the virus has been so successful. It's being spread by people who don't know they're infected. With the original SARS coronavirus, we were able to contain it over the course of about eight or nine months because whenever someone was found to be sick, they could be isolated. And by the time you isolated them, they hadn't really infected many people. In this virus, by the time you're sick, you've already infected several other people. And in addition in this virus, up to 40 to 60% of people never have any symptoms at all. Now, what is the natural history of this disease? Uh, people are exposed to the virus uh, uh, in, uh, usually by a respiratory route, as we'll discuss, that over the next two to 12 days, the virus begins to grow initially in the lungs, uh, growing um, without causing any symptoms at all, and without uh, shedding, uh, without getting to high enough titers to spread into the nose and throat. So people uh, in this period of time uh, won't have symptoms. If you try to culture them for the virus, you won't find it. Uh, and uh, they then began to shed the virus from the nose and throat, spread it to other people. Uh, you can find it by doing nucleic acid testing during this period of time. And then after two or three days of this pre-symptomatic phase, 
they present with symptoms. Some people present with mild symptoms and others may present with severe illness uh, and even present critically ill over a short period of time. And then over a period of four to six days, uh, people uh, uh, usually get better, particularly if they present with mild disease. But people who present with more severe disease are more and more likely to go down this pathway of progressive respiratory failure uh, and uh, in uh, uh, a certain fraction of people, uh, mortality. Uh, we know that uh, this um, cascade that uh, leads to uh, death is more frequently seen in people who are older, and by this I mean people over the age of 55, although uh, it does occur in people who are in, as early in their 20s or in teens. It occurs more often in people with comorbid conditions, uh, including uh, obesity, hypertension, other cardiovascular illnesses, pulmonary disease, including COPD and asthma, uh, diabetes, uh, and, and renal disease. This kinds of conditions that we accumulate as we get older. And the more of these conditions you have, the more likely you are to end up going down this pathway instead of recovering. So in short, this virus is one that invades the body very quickly, doesn't cause symptoms, spreads around, and in some people uh, can cause mortality, but most people recover. Now with that backdrop, uh, where is the virus gone uh, and what's the state in the, in the US at present? Well, I've already made the point that the virus has spread rapidly around the world. Uh, and um, right now the epicenter of the virus, a viral infection uh, in the world is the United States. Although over the course of the last several weeks, Brazil is giving us a run for our money and the slope of the curve in Brazil may be even steeper than it was in the US. In the US, if you look at the uh, case rate uh, from the beginning, starting in early March, you can see a gradual uh, increase initially and then a steep rise that occurred uh, between uh, mid-March and early April. It was driven in large part uh, by uh, New York and a few other cities. And then for a period of time, we were on a glide path. Uh, we all went home, uh, we began to socially distance, and the virus uh, began to gradually decline over the US uh, until about Labor Day, until about uh, Memorial Day. And then since that time, uh, we've seen initially a plateau, and now a rise that's just as steep as it was back uh, in the early part of the epidemic in early March and April, but starting at a much higher plateau. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're sitting here at about 40 to 50,000 cases a day. And Tony Fauci thinks we may be at 100,000 cases a day over the course of the next several weeks. Now, when you look in, a more, in more detail uh, at some of the things that uh, have uh, been uh, driving this curve, there are some states like New York that had a very rapid burst of uh, barrel uh, involvement. Um, the um, uh, Governor Cuomo de declared a state of emergency when there had been about 5,000 cases in New York, uh, 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 put New York on pause, or other state of emergency was declared earlier. But even after this happened, there was a big overshoot in cases. And you remember the pictures of uh, the dire situations in New York City, in particular, where there were not enough respirators, not enough ICU beds, uh, and large numbers of deaths were occurring every day. New York uh, very uh, vigorously uh, shut down. People saw what was going on, they went home. And New York has had a steady decline uh, since uh, the end of April. And you can see they began to open about May 13th, but they opened at a time when the trajectory in the state was clearly on the way down. And they've continued to have an ongoing decline in the number of cases um, and are down now to a situation that uh, is, is really uh, quite impressive compared to where we are in the rest of the country. Now, what's happened in other parts of the country? If I'd shown you this map uh, from uh, late March, you'd have seen a big red splotch here and not much in many other places except New Orleans, which had an early outburst related to uh, Mardi Gras. Soon things shifted to Atlanta, Detroit, uh, and uh, what's happened since that time is the virus has moved into the heartland of the country around meatpacking plants uh, and uh, uh, Native American uh, settlements uh, and uh, locations and also uh, into California and particularly into Southern California. And the virus is indeed exploding in places like Arizona. You can see the uh, outbreak in Arizona is, um, is uh, about the, as bad as any place in the country. 
And you can see the mistake they made is they tried to open at a time when all of the caseload was low, it was not declining, it was rising. And over the next two or three weeks, things smoldered along. And then this, uh, as the state progressively opened, um, a fire was lit and now they're running out of ICU beds. The same thing has happened in Texas. You can see again, they began to reopen before they got down to where New York reopened and again, off they went. They're now in a situation where they've opened uh, Texas Children's Hospital to adults because they're running out of hospital beds in Texas Children's Hospital. Now, what about California? We started out doing very well. Uh, we uh, had a stay at home order. We only had 500 cases in California. As you remember, uh, Governor Cuomo had 5,000 cases in New York and the result was an explosion in New York. We had a gradual rise and I think we got complacent thinking that uh, we got started early and we're going to be fine. And we began to reopen, but again, we began to reopen at a time before the trajectory had started down and we had exactly the same kinetics as in Arizona flatness for a while, and then with a two or three, typical two or three week lag after you uh, kind of punch the hornet's nest of this uh, viral epidemic, we began to see a rise, which has gotten steeper and steeper all the time. Now, much of the California epidemic is being driven by Southern California, uh, particularly LA County, but San Diego County uh, has also been seeing an explosion. Uh, for the longest time in April and early May, we were seeing between 100 and 150 cases a day. You can see that over the course of the last several weeks, we're now up to uh, three to 500 cases a day. This is a massive increase, again, starting uh, with a big uptick uh, after, uh, after Memorial Day. Now, people have talked about this being because we're doing more testing, and indeed we are doing more testing. You can see we've gone from uh, 1,000 cases a day at the beginning of May to about 5,000 cases a day uh, by the beginning of June. And we're now in this 7,000 case a day range. But what's happened is that uh, as we've uh, begun to open up, the fraction of the cases that are positive have, has been rapidly increasing. And this is a clear indication that the virus is spreading uh, very rapidly in the San Diego population. And importantly, when you look to see where it's spreading, there are two uh, issues. There's a geographic issue and that is the geography is that it is spreading particularly south of I-8 um, in populations uh, close to the border. It's spreading up in Oceanside and in Vista. Uh, so it's spreading in the <coughs> north, south, and east of the county. But more importantly than, than that, it's spreading in young people. Uh, and what you can see here is a recent uh, shot of, um, of um, the um, Gas lamp district. I wish I could say I used Photoshop to take the masks off, uh, but I didn't. Uh, this is what's been going on uh, since Memorial Day. And you can see that our epidemic uh, in San Diego is concentrated in people between the ages of 20 and 30. And that's very different from what was seen initially in China, where this histogram would have peaked in the 50s and 60s. Uh, this is particularly uh, ominous because the younger you are, the less likely you are to have symptoms. So what this means is if these are the people we're finding out about because they're having symptoms and being tested, we have a much bigger problem than is indicated by the number, the raw number of cases shown for you here. So with all that doom and gloom, uh, how can we end this? Uh, can we get on, on top of this and begin to think about uh, our next uh, chapter of, of uh, things to deal with? We basically have two different types of approaches with any infectious disease. Uh, the first are non-biomedical interventions, uh, and these include things like quarantine and separating people so the uh, pathogen can't spread from person to person. And then we have biomedical interventions that include vaccines and drugs. Uh, both of these uh, approaches, non-biomedical and biomedical interventions, can play a role in helping us get to where we need to get. UC San Diego obviously wishes to get back to uh, being able to continue the uh, teaching and research and service work that we do. And we've been trying to think about how we can uh, take advantage of the only things we have right now, which are uh, practically speaking, which are non-biological approaches. And we've developed a campus-wide approach that features three very uh, uh, interdigitated um, actions. The first is to try to find ways to prevent transmission of the virus uh, and uh, acquisition by other people. Uh, 
the uh, most the, the biggest three components of this are to have people wear masks uh, whenever they're out of their homes to try to limit density. So uh, by this on a campus population, we would be bringing back fewer students, for example, putting fewer students in individual dorm rooms, having smaller class sizes. Engineering solutions include uh, doing things like making sure air handling is maximized to increase um, air turnover uh, and to uh, prevent face-to-face -face interactions with plexiglass and high contact situations. Um, SARS uh, coronavirus 2 detection is also very important because we want to find people who are infected and to get them out of harm's way so they're not exposing other people to their virus. And we're doing this by very uh, vigorously looking for cases in our healthcare system among our faculty, staff, and students so we can have them recover at home or if need be in the hospital setting. But we've also launched a very uh, ambitious effort to uh, to detect virus in asymptomatic people. So we can find early uh, outbreaks of asymptomatic spread and concentrate on getting the people who are spreading virus into the hands of people who can uh, find out who they're exposed to and send people home uh, and out of harm's way again uh, if they are uh, incubating virus or uh, potentially shedding virus in an asymptomatic fashion. Putting all of these three things together, uh, really makes it much harder for the virus uh, to, uh, to get around any population. And to be a successful, you have to do all three of them. Now let's talk in more detail, uh, primarily about transmission reduction, because this is something that we all can do ourselves and is probably the most important aspect of getting control of this virus epidemic uh, in our country. Now, a lot has been said about how this virus is spread by respiratory uh, routes. And one of the things that I think is important to uh, emphasize is that the route of respiratory spread has been oversimplified and separated into two different types of spread, so-called droplets uh, that are big bundles of liquid that come out when we talk and when we, uh, when we sing or when we yell or cough. And then uh, aerosols, which are much smaller droplets. And a declaration has been made without any research being done that this virus is only spread by droplet spread. Droplets are heavier, they fall to the ground. And what that leads to uh, is um, once you get out of six feet or so from someone who is spreading droplets, the droplets aren't, um, are, are unlikely to be coming your way because, you're, because they fall into the ground unless of course you happen to be downwind or if they're coughing or sneezing. But what has evolved is a combination of public health officials and the press asking repetitively, so how close can I get? And the answer has been droplets only have a six foot radius. So what's happened is a, uh, a, a continuous variable has been dichotomized in an overly simplistic way. And this, this six foot uh, social distancing perimeter has been artificially set um, at which point you're supposed to put on a mask because you're no longer socially distanced. Now the problem with that, in addition to the fact that uh, wind comes along and people cough and sneeze, is that there are also these aerosols. Aerosols are much smaller and they don't fall to the ground. And they do two things. They can spread over a longer period of time and they can stay in the air uh, after you left the room and they also can, can lead to spread. They also can settle on surfaces like desktops, uh, and on doorknobs. Uh, you can also put uh, virus from your saliva uh, uh, as you touch your mouth and touch doorknobs on uh, other things that people touch. So this virus spreads by a combination of droplets, aerosols, and fomites. Um, in terms of importance, it really depends on where you are. Fomites are thought to be less important than they used to be, as we've learned more about the overall uh, components of the virus. Uh, spread. If you stand very close to somebody, you're getting exposed to both media, uh, droplets and uh, airborne spread. You can get uh, infected by aerosols or droplets. But if you're sitting farther away, you can still get infected uh, by aerosols. And that's a very good reason to wear masks. Now, the, for the droplet fanatics, uh, one very important thing to point out is that uh, here's a, uh, one of the choirs that um, was uh, infected at a very high attack rate. 75% of people in this choir were infected with SARS coronavirus from one performance uh, several months ago. And the reason that's important is you can see that this person is more than 6.1 feet from this person. 
This is an aerosol, a virus that was created around this choir singing and having the virus uh, coming off of their vocal cords and creating a cloud around all of these non-mask wearing people. So um, as you can tell, um, I'm a very strong proponent of masks, whether you're within six feet of someone or not. Now, the most important part of masks isn't that they prevent you from getting infected, but they also prevent you, if you are infected, from spreading virus to other people. Uh, and what this shows is uh, the number of viral copies of the SARS coronavirus uh, in uh, throat swabs and in nasal swabs, you can see quite a bit. Uh, if you don't wear a mask and you're uh, just uh, uh, catching droplets coming out of somebody's uh, uh, mouth, you can see that there still are thousands of uh, viral particles per sample. Uh, when you put a mask on, you can see that the number of particles per sample goes down. And you can see that if you're farther away and just looking at small particles, without a mask, aerosols come down. And with masks, there are aerosols. And this has implications from the standpoint of transmission. This is some very interesting work done by, again, by KYUN and his colleagues at Hong Kong University, uh, in which he looked at hamsters uh, to look at the ability of surgical masks to prevent transmission uh, in a hamster colony. Now, although the graphic is nice, he wasn't really trying to get the hamsters to wear surgical masks. But he rigged a very ingenious uh, caging system in which he separated infected hamsters from uninfected hamsters, either without any barrier or with a surgical mask uh, coating, either uh, uh, facing the direction of the infected hamsters or the uh, direction of the uninfected hamsters. To make a long story short, masks decrease the infection rate in both directions uh, but they work best if they, were, uh, if they were facing away from the hamsters who were infected. So they were preventing the, uh, the virus from ever getting to the, infected, uh, to the uninfected hamsters. Translating that into, um, into um, humans, uh, if you look at this, um, this um, cartoon from a paper that was published in Science uh, last week, uh, you can see kind of three different scenarios. Here's a person who is talking without a mask and she is, she is expelling droplets and aerosols. Uh, you can see that this person sitting here with no mask on is going to get both of them in the face. This person is wearing a mask and this mask will take out a fair um, amount, but not all of the aerosols and uh, droplets. But in this situation, uh, she's wearing a mask uh, and that decreases the exposure of the person who is not masked, but even more so, it substantially decreases the exposure of the person who is also masked, perhaps getting the person to uh, an exposure level that is unlikely to be infected. And less appreciated, but also very important, is there is emerging evidence that the higher the dose of virus you get when you're exposed, the more likely you are to have severe disease. Uh, I won't go through all the data, but we can perhaps later, this person uh, exposed to all of this virus is much more likely to be sick if she's not wearing a, if she's exposed to someone not wearing a mask than if she gets a smaller dose here. And so from your own perspective in terms of safety, you're protecting yourself and others from getting really sick by getting, uh, reducing your exposure if you happen to get infected. Now, we've also heard a lot about herd immunity, and uh, the concept of herd immunity is, is what protects us from many of the other infectious diseases that we have around us. If enough people in the population are infected, there's no way for the virus to get anywhere. Uh, and uh, you end up being protected by the people around you who are, even if you're susceptible to a viral pathogen, because they can't get infected and the virus can't get to you. In the case of this virus, it's so-called R0, which is the, an expression that calculates the number of people you're likely on the average to, to infect if you're infected. The R0 in this virus is between three and five if you're just out in the general population. What that means is if I am infected, uh, I'm on average likely uh, to infect three to five people. So suppose it's four people uh, and I infect four people. Each of these four people will infect four more people. So you soon have within four days, um, 
you've gone from one person to four per people to 16 people and in four more days to 64 people. So this virus explosively um, uh, is transmitted uh, without any uh, social distancing and masks. And what these do is they kind of throw a blanket over this and decrease the R naught uh, closer to uh, less than one. And when they get to less than one, what gradually happens is the virus dies out in the community. Now people have said, why not just take the people who are particularly at risk for coronavirus, tell them to stay home and we'll just get everybody infected and get done with it. Who's not at risk. They can have uh, the, a little bit of flu and they can go back to work after they're protected. And then the people who would really be sick if they got infected can come back out of hiding. Uh, the virus will be gone and we'll all be fine. Well, there's several different problems with this. First of all is that uh, the number of people who are getting sick uh, and who are young is not trivial. Uh, we also are worried and beginning to see evidence that even young people who become ill can have substantial longer lasting damage to their lungs after about a coronavirus infection. So it's not innocuous to be infected even if you're long, young and we can't predict who these people will be. Secondly, um, young people and old people are exposed to each other. Uh, even if you stay home, somebody's going to bring you your food. Somebody in the family uh, is your grandson or granddaughter. Uh, and there's no real way to, um, to um, actively separate, uh, efficiently enough separate young and old people. If you think about the uh, initial uh, explosion of the virus in the U.S., you could say, well, we had all the old people in, um, in um, uh, nursing homes, uh, they should have been safe. Well, once the virus got there, it killed a lot of people. So uh, separating the older people is not feasible. The place that this was tried was Sweden. And if you look at the mortality rate per 100,000 population uh, by country, you can see that the two countries that did worst were the UK and Italy. And this was because their intensive care units became overwhelmed at the surge. They ran out of respirators. They didn't intubate people who should have been intubated. They said, if you're over 60, 65, no, no tube for you. Uh, in Italy, they were taking people off the respirator if they couldn't get better over several days. And so they had a lot of people who would not have died other places because their peak was way too high for their medical care system. Sweden tried this thing of, of telling the older people to get home, to stay home, uh, and let the younger people get infected. And you can see they had the third highest death rate of all of them. And they still only got to a, a level of herd immunity of less than 10%. So that uh, the person who came up with this idea in Sweden has now said it was a mistake to try. The uh, instrument was too blunt to separate people and they led, they, it led to a large number of people who um, uh, died without generating enough immunity to protect them when they came back out. You can see uh, other mortality rates are lower, uh, particularly in places like uh, the US uh, where we have uh, better uh, capacity, uh, this part of this was driven by New York, uh, but where there, is, uh, where there is good medical care and capacity, the mortality rate should be nothing uh, like what we are seeing here. So uh, what's happened now? Uh, so we've been talking about non-biomedical intervention so far, uh, and this includes masks and distancing, uh, testing and isolation. These are the things that other countries have done to get control of the viral epidemic. And what this has done in many other countries has, has essentially brought the epidemic uh, to a point that people can go back to work. And when there are outbreaks, uh, the outbreaks can be controlled by sending uh, public health um, contact tracers in, isolating people, uh, and then uh, ending that uh, little outburst and going back to work. What's happened in the US, this shows you the US. Uh, despite all of our efforts, you can see we're still on the upswing. And that's because we really haven't done the hard work of staying, um, keeping uh, the virus, getting the virus under good enough control before we went back to work and before we went back to, uh, to interact with each other. And the problem with all of that is that um, the virus has taken advantage of it and we're having a curve that's just as steep as it was as it earlier, as early on, but from a higher baseline. This is Brazil. You can see they're in the same boat we're in, no social distancing, no masking. Brazil is in a lot of trouble, but a lot of other countries have gotten it under control and are getting back to normal. Uh, we're now, uh, we have the distinction of being one of the countries that Europeans will not allow uh, us to visit because of the disparity in attack rates uh, in the US uh, and in Europe. 
So what are the kinds of things that are beginning to happen uh, that might uh, lead to some, uh, um, some optimism? We're beginning to see some of the, uh, we're beginning to realize that some of the things people were doing uh, are quite risky. An outbreak of this, this was all, this has all been since Friday, just a few headlines. 60 Texas college students go for spring break in Mexico and come back infected. Uh, but what that's led to is that as the coronavirus spikes have begun to occur in a number of states, uh, in a number of locations, um, we've begun to see states beginning to, uh, even with uh, even the red states, beginning to reverse the liberalizations, as the governors have realized that uh, early liberalization just led to them uh, heading down the uh, pathway of Italy and New York, which is what they were smugly saying we will never be because uh, we um, uh, have, um, we're very different here. Uh, they're not different at all from Italy and New York, uh, and they're headed in that direction. But over the last several days, I think one of the most uh, hopeful signs is that people are, in these states are beginning to pay attention and separate themselves from the national dialogue of don't worry about masks, don't worry about uh, uh, it's all over with, let's put it behind us. And if we see this uh, leadership from, uh, in terms of the epidemic uh, that we have missed at the national level, begin to be uh, responsibly led at the state level, we hopefully may begin to see uh, some more sustained impact on viral spread. Now let me turn and talk a bit about vaccines because there has been a lot of discussion about, we just need to kind of hang in there till we get a vaccine. When we get a vaccine, we can go back to school. When we get a vaccine, we can go back to work. We'll have a vaccine soon. Uh, that um, that um, uh, refrain has been something that we've heard uh, since uh, March. And I think it's important to understand that although we are much more sophisticated in our vaccine technology than ever before, uh, we, have a, we may have a long way to go before we get a vaccine and we, may, ne we ne may never get a vaccine. So why would that be? Well, the good news is we have lots of different vaccine platforms. Most of them were developed uh, in the uh, effort to develop an AIDS vaccine. Uh, they include uh, traditional protein-based vaccines, messenger RNA, DNA, chimeric viruses, some of the more imaginative things you can even, uh, that weren't even thought about even as recently as eight or 10 years ago. The reason we have them is people have been trying in vain to develop an AIDS vaccine since 1984, when we were promised we'd have a vaccine that could be put into the general population by 1986. So it's important to realize that um, although it's great to have a goal, you have to think about whether you can achieve that goal and, and plan for not having it until you see you have it. So where are we with the vaccine studies? We know now that some of these approaches can in, induce immune responses to the virus in people, uh, certainly in animals, uh, but there are several things we don't know. Uh, we don't know which of the immune responses that we're seeing generated in people uh, are the ones that prevent you from being infected if you encounter someone in a bar who happens to be shedding coronavirus. Is it neutralizing antibodies? Is it cytotoxic T cells, a combination of, the, of both? Uh, and until we know that, uh, it's hard to know what to strive for in vaccine technology to maximize the most protective type of immunity. Another important issue is that with coronaviruses uh, in general, uh, both in animals and in humans, and with the coronaviruses we've been infected with for many years, immunity doesn't last long. That's why the traditional coronaviruses that cause the winter flu that we talked about earlier come back every three or four years because our immune response wanes very quickly. And the same thing as I'll show you in a minute is happening uh, with this uh, coronavirus, both from people who got infected and from the vaccines that are being studied. And then finally, uh, we know that in animal models uh, that when you try to um, uh, immunize an older animal uh, like with a coronavirus vaccine, they make much less powerful immune responses than younger animals. And in this epidemic, the people that are most likely to get sick are older people. So we may find ourselves being unable to uh, vaccinate effectively the people who need uh, immunity the most. Now, what are some of the data that support some of these comments? Well, this is a study that was published in Nature Medicine last month uh, that looked at uh, people either had symptoms related to uh, coronavirus, uh, SARS coronavirus 2, or did not. And if you look at the people without symptoms in green, 
and look at their antibody titers compared to those in red, this is a logarithmic scale, you can see between 100 and 1,000 times higher antibody levels in people who had symptoms than people who didn't have symptoms. So uh, you think, well, this is kind of counterintuitive because you think the people who um, uh, were, uh, were symptomatic, why would they have, why would the people who didn't have symptoms, why would they have lower antibody levels? You think they have better immune responses. The reason for this is that those who had symptoms were exposed for a long period of time to a lot of viral antigen and they generated strong immune responses eventually that control the virus, but it took a couple of weeks of very high levels of virus to generate this immunity. People with lower levels of virus who didn't have symptoms didn't need to develop much immunity and so they didn't bother. And you can imagine that if you're just trying to stick a little protein in the arm and trying to get immune responses even as robust as people who are infected for a week and have virus replicating in their lungs and GI tract and other places, uh, we're likely going to have immune responses down in here. Now, when you look at what happens after they recover, this is back from this, uh, taking the same people and looking at them several weeks later, you can see that the decay in the immune responses is quite dramatic as well. Again, a logarithmic scale. And you can extrapolate and see where you're going to be before too long uh, with uh, antibody levels uh, or with neutralization. And again, a feature of other coronaviruses, and it makes you worry uh, about longevity uh, of immunity in people who have been infected. And that's important uh, from the perspective of uh, one of the things that people have been asking, are you protected from reinfection if you've been infected already? My hunch is that at least for a while you will be, but that while will be variable. Uh, and uh, until we have some data in real people exposed to real virus in, in, uh, in nature, in other words, in our cities, we won't know how long the immunity lasts or how effective it is. The other reason this is important, if you go back and start thinking about herd immunity and the idea of just going out and getting everybody infected, if we could take all of the uh, older people, all the people at risk for coronavirus because they have underlying conditions and we're younger and send them to the moon for a few months and get everybody infected on the earth and then bring them the uh, ones back who were susceptible, uh, if all to, to disease, if all the people we made immune are on this trajectory, we're going to be back where we started in the not too distant future. So this is not like polio virus herd immunity that lasts for life. This is immunity that is not going to be durable uh, if one is trying to develop herd immunity. And then finally, with uh, the only vaccine that actually has a phase two study published in the peer reviewed literature, the CanSino vaccine. Uh, let's look at the immunity here. This looks like a complicated slide, but it really isn't. Uh, they looked at three different uh, doses of drug, low in blue, medium in uh, green, and high in red. They looked at uh, interferon gamma uh, producing cells, a measure of T cell immunity. The more of these producing uh, interferon producing cells you have, the more uh, your T cells are riled up uh, by seeing uh, this vaccine when you're vaccinated, when you re-expose them to viral antigens uh, down the road two days later, two weeks later. And you can see that regardless of the dose of vaccine you got, within 14 days of this peak response, you're already seeing these immune responses decaying. And that's true whether you're looking at T cell responses or at neutralizing antibody responses. So um, for a vaccine to be uh, that helpful to us as a population, we're going to need something you can give and count on for several years, not that you have to give to however many trillion people there are in the world and repeat it every six months or eight months. So now let's close and talk about uh, therapeutics, uh, going back to the cartoon we talked about before. As I mentioned, uh, virus grows here uh, unopposed and drives the disease. So you might think that antiviral therapy would be a good way to prevent things that happen downstream. And once things get going and some people begin to develop this cytokine storm and develop respiratory failure, immune modulators, things that put a damper on the immune response might be ways to prevent respiratory failure. And so I'll talk today about examples of a couple of these approaches. I won't talk about hydroxychloroquine except to cross it off the list. There was a lot of hype about it being potentially beneficial. It's been definitively shown not to be helpful and has substantial toxicity. So uh, I hope all of you are uh, now off your hydroxychloroquine and are thinking about other therapeutic agents. 
I'm going to talk today only about two uh, therapeutic agents. I'll talk about remdesivir as an example of an antiviral drug and dexamethasone as an example of a drug that dampens the immune response. Remdesivir is a uh, nucleoside analog that's very similar uh, to, in structure, to drugs we use to treat HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, a placebo-controlled study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, with remdesivir uh, that showed uh, in a group of patients who were sick enough to be in the hospital and uh, most of them requiring oxygen and some of them being on a respirator at the time they started, that the uh, time to recovery was accelerated uh, by about 30% in people receiving remdesivir. Now, this study uh, was uh, done in a way that uh, happens with all crash uh, studies. Um, hospitals tried to get the uh, drug, the uh, study approved through their institutional review board. And as soon as their review board approved the study, every patient in that hospital who was eligible for the study got started. So you had people with a whole spectrum of disease getting started from early disease or late disease. And when you break down where people were with disease, uh, this again is a complicated slide, but I'll try to make it simple. Uh, looking at the mortality rate, uh, there was about a 30% uh, improvement in survival in people who received remdesivir compared to placebo. It did not quite make statistical significance, uh, but this was taking people uh, who included people who were on a respirator or on uh, extracorporeal uh, oxygen, uh, uh, membrane oxygenation at the time the, the drug was started when the damage was already done, and people who were in the hospital but not even requiring oxygen who were gonna do well anyway. So if you look at the people who were kind of in the middle, uh, who were sick enough to be in the hospital uh, and require oxygenation, you can see that the uh, survival benefit was substantially greater. And again, shown graphically uh, 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 in the, uh, not shown graphically, I'll take this back, I apologize. Uh, but when you think about this graphically, you can see that uh, the mortality rate is lower if you start the disease earlier uh, and the benefit is greater. So in real life, we would be starting the disease, the drug here rather than starting a bunch of people on it here or too early. So I think the initial remdesivir study underestimated the potential benefit of remdesivir, and hopefully uh, will at least provide a backstop for people who are at substantial risk of, of death from uh, the disease. The drawbacks of remdesivir are that it's only available intravenously, uh, and it has uh, uh, side effects, uh, uh, including um, causing hepatitis in some patients that prevent us from giving higher doses of drug and I think when you look at people who uh, get the drug, although it has a benefit, it's not a home run. And I think with a more potent antiviral effect, we would have a more beneficial clinical effect. So the efforts are ongoing now to add other antiviral uh, agents to this, including plasma from people who've recovered and monoclonal antibodies. There's a, uh, there is a rush to develop oral versions of remdesivir, which allow us to treat people uh, before they start down this cascade uh, and even out of the hospital. So I think there is uh, a great up, um, potent, upwards potential in uh, drug therapeutics uh, over time. Uh, this is the so-called recovery study. And this was a study that looked at corticosteroids. And there was a lot of fanfare about this about two weeks ago uh, in a press conference held from Oxford. And to cut to the chase, uh, looking at people who were admitted to the hospital and were randomized to receive either dexamethasone or receive usual care, you can see the mortality rate was substantially better in people receiving remdesivir. So there is evidence um, in the, this trial uh, with some caveats that, I, again, I won't get into tonight, that suggests that if we can carefully modulate the immune response in the right patient populations, those who aren't doing well because of respiratory inflammation, we can, have, we can benefit some people. So now if we go back to our, uh, to our cartoon here and uh, start with where we've been so far. Uh, we already have seen that um, non-biomedical interventions have had a big impact of the, on the virus and the rest of the world. We now uh, have evidence that uh, vaccine research is underway and we have drugs beginning to show an impact. And so we can add uh, drugs and vaccines and I think increasingly over time be able to add these to our quiver to be able to, uh, to deal with the virus in a better way. Now, I've already kind of cast some cold water on vaccines. So what happens if we have no vaccine? Well, 
if you go back and think about it, we have no AIDS vaccine and AIDS is a different disease now. Uh, it's a different disease because we have antiretroviral drugs that will prevent the virus from replicating and preserve immunity. If we have drugs that can be given to people at early stages of disease that don't cause toxicity, can be given orally or can be given intramuscularly uh, when people start having any evidence of, of infection, you can imagine that uh, we may be able to uh, deal with this disease uh, on a population basis uh, with therapeutics if we first get it under control by vigorously paying attention to what we've been hearing about from public health officials, uh, getting the overall instance of the disease down with masks and distancing and, and less interaction among ourselves to a point that we have few enough cases in the population that we can then go in with testing and tracing and quarantine and root out uh, hot spots for the virus uh, using uh, drugs as a backup for people who slip through the cracks uh, we should be able over time to get back uh, to uh, uh, life as uh, we almost knew it, uh, even if we're uh, not successful with developing a vaccine. Now, the reason I think it's important to think about it in this way is that um, if you have the mentality that, yeah, we're going to have a vaccine soon, people are talking about the fall, then your mentality is, gee, we don't have to worry so much about what we need to do to get back to business and back to work. We'll just, we can just kind of hunker down a little bit and then go back to whatever. But if you think about it, and we never get a vaccine, we're not gonna have that luxury. We'll be in a situation in which we always will have to be looking over our shoulder about this virus coming back. And we're gonna be much more in much more danger if we're running at this with a high level of virus in the community and we haven't taken advantage of what we know to tamp the virus down and to be able to work, live in a community in which very little virus is shedding. So I'm happy to stop there and I'd be interested in any questions or comments anybody has. I've enjoyed this very much and um, I hope we have a chance for some discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for Dr. Scully, um, uh, for the excellent, eloquent and informative presentation. And I think he deserves a virtual round of applauses. And we will proceed now with the questions and answers. Uh, do you want me to go through them, Dr. Scully, or do you want to check well, why, out? Why don't, you, why don't you get started and I'll get us off screen share so we can see each other again. Perfect. So one, the first one was today's New York Times has an article entitled, most people with coronavirus won't spread it. Why do a few infect many? That's a great question. And um, many infectious diseases are the same way. There's kind of a rule of 20% of the people with most infections, uh, with 20% of people account for 80% of the infections. And it may be that there's some people who shed large amounts of virus, uh, much higher levels of virus than other people. Uh, with this particular infection, it may be that there's some people who, by virtue of how they talk, loud talkers, talk with their mouth open, uh, who uh, aerosolize virus off their vocal cords, create bigger clouds of virus around them. There may be people uh, who combine that with be, being in a larger crowd of people, so they have an opportunity to infect more people uh, at a time when they have more virus around them. Uh, and uh, uh, when you combine all of these, what you end up with is uh, safety, um, uh, not as much risk uh, most of the time, but in some situations, great risk. And that makes it very hard to be able to calculate what to tell people about. So could I just go over to somebody's house for the night and share dinner with them? They look fine. Uh, when you just do it one, with one person, you're just taking the risk with that one person. But if you go to a backyard barbecue, you could be in a situation where one person in that barbecue is one of these super spreaders and everybody in that barbecue or almost everybody becomes infected. That was what happened in that church choir that I mentioned to you. There was a very famous outbreak of a super spreader uh, at a Biogen conference in, um, in um, uh, Boston at the beginning of the epidemic in which 80 out of 150 attendees became infected. So these super spreaders, um, probably for biological reasons and reasons of opportunity because they happen to be in places indoors without masks, with a lot of people without masks, can uh, expose many people in a short period of time to high levels of virus. Excellent. So there is another one. Why are we not producing concentrated COVID convalescent immune, immune globally? 
that can be administered in a small volume by local intramuscular injection. This can be done in a very short time. And yes, I probably think that you can answer that question. Well, there's a lot of work going on looking at whether passive immunity will protect people from, um, uh, will reduce disease. Uh, animal models suggest that it will have a beneficial effect if given at the right time. Uh, the um, KYUN and Tom Rogers here uh, at uh, UC San Diego have studied in Syrian hamsters the uh, use of, of um, plasma uh, from, um, in Tom's case, um, uh, antibodies from people who have recovered, um, monoclonal antibodies, uh, plasma from recovered hamsters, neutralizing antibodies will reduce the titer of virus uh, and will reduce uh, disease. So there's good animal model data that this is very beneficial. Uh, if it turns out that this form of immunity um, does prevent uh, disease, we need to then think about ways to produce it, uh, that it can be given conveniently. And immune globulin is one of those ways. At this point, we, haven't, we don't have the proof of concept that uh, either monoclonal antibodies uh, or uh, convalescent plasma concentrated, uh, either unconcentrated or concentrated, uh, can prevent uh, ongoing disease uh, in someone. There's a lot of work being done now with uh, high titer neutralizing antibodies uh, that are pretty broad in terms of the uh, strains of virus that they neutralize. And it may turn out that uh, if neutraliz neutralizing antibodies are successful, this will be a much more practical way to make large uh, numbers of doses of neutralization, neutralizing antibodies, than trying to collect it from many, many people and concentrate uh, neutralizing antibodies into, uh, in a pool, uh, pools of, uh, of uh, plasma from many people uh, in uh, hyperimmune globulin. And it may turn out to be safer. So, my own feeling is we need to first prove the concept and then at the same time we're proving the concept with convalescent plasma, look with monoclonals and then decide whether monoclonals or hyperimmune globulin is the way to go. Excellent. We have several questions regarding the mask. So let's go, the general public doesn't like to wear a cloth mask because they got hot, their glasses, glasses fog up, so would wearing a plastic shield in a set of a mask work yes as well? Uh, plastic uh, shields help, but they're not as effective as masks because they don't prevent uh, aerosols from getting around the mask. They're just created when you talk. Uh, if you wear a, um, um, a mask, you're actually getting things as they come right out of your mouth. If you wear a shield, uh, you prevent droplets from being projected directly at somebody, but they don't prevent aerosols from coming around you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Beccarizzo, uh, I suspect, operates uh, in a mask rather than a shield, do you not? And sometimes both. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, another question is, um, is kind of similar. Are these studies only for surgical masks? What about uh, clothes? Uh, max, uh, where most people are using it? Well, there is a lot of work going on now to try to look at relative um, of efficacy of different types of, um, of uh, facial barriers. The um, one that is most effective um, is the so-called uh, uh, PAPR, which is a, essentially a respirator that you put over your head and wear around like a spacesuit. Uh, we don't use that in public. Uh, we used to use that in, uh, in uh, Ebola virus days, uh, but the N95 mask, uh, which is used in surgical settings, is probably the most effective. Uh, we don't use them in the public because there aren't enough of them to go around. It's not because they're as effective as traditional surgical masks. And by that, I mean three-ply cloth masks that you tie behind your head or around your ears. These are uh, about as effective as N95 masks, but not quite. Um, you have to be exposed to relatively large amounts of virus in pediatric offices when people try to do studies to show whether a uh, N95 mask is better than a surgical mask, but they are a little better, but not, uh, not a lot better. When you get down to cloth masks, uh, they're not as effective as surgical masks. And uh, within cloth masks, having multiple plies uh, as opposed to just a single level. And if they're cotton, 
having a dense weave, a large thread count, uh, increases the efficiency. And probably the least effective is if you tie an old t-shirt around your mouth, you'll catch a few droplets, but you don't really prevent aerosols. So there is a whole hierarchy of things. And I think we need to move beyond um, just thinking about telling people that you should wear a face covering to massively producing surgical masks, the easy ones that you just loop behind your ears because they're, they're better than surgical, than, uh, than um, t-shirts and bandanas and other things and, and try to get people to wear them. Uh, I uh, have gotten fairly used to them. I'm sure that people who are in the operating room all the time don't even uh, uh, notice them by the time they've been acclimated to them. And I think uh, that uh, we need to start thinking about them uh, in that, per uh, in that uh, perspective. Very good. Um, another question is, if it's possible the transmission of the virus via uh, the office air conditioning or the heating? Or the heating? Uh, it's, it would be hard to do that. Uh, the uh, viruses do, uh, as I said, you can have them aerosolized. Most offices, though, have relatively high efficiency filters. They create large numbers of air exchanges, uh, and uh, you don't really have um, um, a lot of virus being spread, like from office to office, high concentrations of virus, uh, even if you happen to have somebody uh, in the building who's... Uh, who's uh, uh, shedding coronavirus. And if that person is shedding coronavirus but wearing a mask, you can imagine that the amount of virus that would get into the uh, air to begin with would be really quite low. Another one, how long does the virus survive in the aerosol con con uh, condition? Uh, there are a couple of aspects to that. One is um, you know, how long do the aerosols stay in the air? And that depends on how still the air is and how much um, um, uh, how, um, uh, how, how the concentration of aerosols is. And uh, you could count on a couple of hours uh, would probably be reasonable in a still room with a, with a high inoculum load. You would like to know what New Zealand did so well to control the, um, the spread of the virus. New Zealand took it seriously. They, when they went home, they went home and stayed home. Nobody was out. If you were out, you got in trouble. And they have a geography that we don't have, which is a lot of water between them and anybody else. And they stopped letting people in. Um, and anybody who came in had to be quarantined. Now, the problem with screening at the airports and doing only that is that, as you remember, there's this two to 12 day incubation period during which time you're not symptomatic and you're not shedding virus. And anybody who arrives in that period is gonna slide right through symptom screening, they're gonna slide right through um, uh, viral shedding screening, and then they'll pop up with infection uh, a, a week later uh, when they've gone on to visit whoever they're visiting. And um, so what New Zealand did is said, if you're coming into New Zealand, uh, you have to be quarantined for 14 days and they put you, uh, lock you up in a hotel until you're past that time that you're likely to have active disease. And that coupled with their very vigorous contact tracing uh, and separation uh, has essentially extinguished the virus on the, on the island. So my hat's off to them. Um, another question, do you have any thoughts about what vaccine mechanism might have the best chance for success? Um, you know, I think neutralization will be very important. Um, the, um, uh, most of the work that I did when I was younger uh, as an immunologist was with cytotoxic T cells. I think they may turn out to be very important as well in terms of preventing disease, um, uh, preventing disease after you get infected. They'll be, I think, less effective in, in uh, preventing uh, acquisition of the virus. Uh, but I think we'll just have to see as, uh, as we begin to uh, go out with vaccines that have different levels of different types of immunity and learn how effective they are when people start getting exposed to others who are shedding virus. Okay. Uh, if you, I think we are almost, uh, will be almost the last one. If you do not test UCSD students every day, how can you stop infections on campus? Well, the, um, if we uh, are finding um, cases on campus when we have uh, a small cluster of eight or 10 people, we can use our epidemiologic interventions and isolate those students and the ones they've been in contact with. 
And with a mathematical model that Natasha Martin has put together with Victor Di Grotola, uh, if we're able to test um, all the students and faculty, um, or even 70% of them once a month, we'll have a 90% chance of picking up uh, any cluster of virus that gets to be that large and be able to have Cheryl Anderson, our Dean of the School of Public Health and her team um, intervene, um, make sure that student or faculty member is getting the health care they need and isolate them in their contacts and extinguish the outbreak. You're absolutely right to catch any case, uh, even a single case, you'd have to test everybody every day. This unfortunately just isn't feasible. But if we get it down to a low enough level that we can circle around clusters and extinguish them, we can make the campus a safer place to be than, uh, than in the population in general. And just the last one, is it's going to be really the last one. Have we measured immune memory in individuals recovering from inf infection? We've not done that yet. And it'll be interesting to uh, look at what happens when people who've recovered from infection are tweaked with some of the vaccines that are out there to see if they have uh, what amount to anamnestic responses that you don't see in people who are seeing the virus for the first time. That'll be a very important study and that, that's a great question. So thank you very much, Dr. Schooley, for your time and your excellent presentation. And to you all for attending the webinar. Sorry, we couldn't go to and answer all the questions. We will send you a link for the recording and let you know when we are going to have our next Fulbright virtual speaker series. Wear a mask, be safe, and thanks for joining us. Bye-bye, adios, ciao. Bye-bye.